live from Michigan City, Indiana. It's the very first ep- episode of Long Arm TV Live. Woo! Hello, everybody, Hello, everybody and, and welcome, welcome to the Quilters Apothecary. Now, now, this is our maiden voyage, of course, so if we run into any technical difficulties, just please forgive us as we kind of work our way through it. Um, so today, I did want to say, uh, and then I'm going to have Rich jump in for a little bit, that what we're going to do today is have a kind of a question and answer session, and then towards the end, um, maybe talk a little bit about um, what you'd like to see down the road, because we want to be able to provide the things that you want to see. Now, obviously, we're actually jumping into this a few weeks early, just because of uh, the whole um, quarantine, self-quarantine type issues that are going on out there, and so... Um, we're, we're excited, but we're also a little nervous because we weren't quite ready, but we're, we're, we're going to jump in feet first, and uh, like I said, there'll be a little bit of trial and error. Over this weekend, we're really going to hit hard because, of course, I, I think that everybody's going a little stir-crazy, so a little bit of entertainment is good for everybody, and what we're going to be doing is a little bit of everything. We're going to be going over some new quilt designs that I've come up with um, for modern quilts and also for quilts with a lot of uh, open area where we want to put some definite designs in. I also have four custom quilts that I have loaded on different machines that we're going to be doing a little bit of work on each one of those. Um, And also I've had a lot of people say, hey, this whole dirty pour acrylic painting thing, will you do a little bit of that? So I'll probably do like one or two little live episodes of that and have that up there for those that want to broaden their horizon and maybe do a little bit of exploring with that type of thing on fabric. Um, So that's kind of what our plan is. And as this progresses, we're going to actually try to do this um, once a week just to kind of keep everybody engaged, um, hopefully even past when everybody's free to go out and about. And so... Again, welcome to Quilters Apothecary. We're glad you're here. And Rich, if you want to talk a little bit about the Long Arm TV. Hi, everybody. This is, uh, this is there we go. Hi, everybody. Again, sorry, we probably have a lot of glitches and stuff on our first try here. Uh, so some of you may have noticed we've started a new website in a new face or a uh, YouTube page. There is now a YouTube page for uh, just for Quilters Apothecary. A lot of Jamie's videos from the past have all been remastered, uh, new music and everything, and we've put them on that page. And what we've done that's unique and different now, if you go to our website, longarmtv.com, longarmtv.com is a free website, no membership or anything. And on that website, it's basically a pointing mechanism to all these different videos out there. And also on the pages for the video right below, you will find links to the the common products that people ask about because I, I get a lot of emails, questions, phone calls. And I saw Jamie use something and it was uh, up on the video and where can I find that? So there'll be a lot of direct links to there. Uh, and then keep uh, checking on longarmtv.com and as the uh, months and years go by, we'll be adding a lot of new content. But all of Jamie's new videos that are coming out will be posting on the Quilters Apothecary YouTube channel. The, the ones that are on Jamie's channel will still remain there, but Jamie kind of liked to go a different way on his channel, adding more art, more uh, pouring videos, uh, cooking videos, all sorts of things like that. So this is going to be our way of being able to give Jamie a little bit more creativity on his personal channel. And then the Coulter's Apothecary YouTube page will have all those other things. And let me... Put that up for you right there. You'll see longarmtv.com. If you go there, uh, and again, it's just a hub to get you around between the different videos that we have. Uh, and they're kind of categorized now. They're in different places. They'll tell you where to go, what to look for, things like that. 
Um, I think, that, is there anything else, Jamie, I needed to cover? On some, On some of the, some of the older, older videos, videos, you'll notice, notice that, that I used to, uh, you know, this was before I started, I started dyeing dying. my hair gray to look older. So you might notice a little bit of that. No, actually, that sounds good. And again, you already mentioned it's free. You know, um, we wanted to provide something because we know that a lot of people right now and probably for a little time to come are going to be struggling with income. They might have a hard time getting out to shows right now until all of this stuff settles down. And again, we are a community, and um, it's not always about the money. And the other thing that I want to make very clear is, yes, there will be times I will be talking about products that I use, but it's never a sales push. And it's always just about, this is what I use, this is what works for me. Um, you know, and also, I always want to make very clear that these are the things that work for me, and these are the techniques that work for me. There are a lot of amazing teachers, and hopefully we'll have some other wonderful teachers step forward and really get going with um, channels of their own so that that way, from the comfort of your own home while you're in front of your long arm, you'll be able to enjoy things and, and not always have to travel and do things. And then maybe down the road what we're going to do is we're going to actually have a classroom page where um, we actually do nice long workshops but again from the comfort of your own home and you can take them at your own pace um, with question and answer sessions but again that's down the road we're just kind of working our way through it um, the one thing that I would say as well is right now um, a few guidelines I don't want to say rules because I don't want to make rules like that but I do want to say that there are a few guidelines this is quilting and art so as we are watching the live feeds, you know, the, a few rules that I want to say is don't feed the trolls. We're going to get trolls. We're going to get people that come on and they're going to be making comments and you're going to want to respond to them. Rich is going to do his very best to try to make sure that um, he can get them off the page as quick as possible. Um, but don't feed them. Just let them be there and we will get rid of them as soon as we see them. Um, also, um, since this is art, and this is everybody, and that means everybody from every walk of life. Please be kind on the on the question and answer feed, the, the verbal feed or the written feed that you're going to be writing. Um, uh, I don't want any politics on there. I don't really want any, um, any religious stuff or anything like that just because we want to respect everybody involved. And we want to keep this all about art and quilting um, and whatever other topic that's being covered at the moment that isn't a firebrand topic. So those are some of the things that um, I would like to kind of keep as guidelines for everybody. Mr. Ritchie, anything else on your end? Okay, so I figured this is how the first one's going to go. It's going to be a nice chat session. Um, and then tomorrow we'll start with some quilt designs. Um, and I'll show you before the end of this, this particular uh, episode of this live broadcast. Um, what we're going to actually be working on tomorrow. And then tonight, or first thing in the morning, I will actually have a, a schedule up of different things that we're going to be doing throughout the weekend and into the beginning of next week. So that, that way you know, this I want to see, this I'm not so interested in, and you can make choices based on that. Also, remember, um, just because it's live right now does not mean you can't watch it later. So if you are at a job or you are busy taking care of somebody or... Um, this just isn't the right time for you because you're at your machine or doing other things um, that you can watch this at at your leisure. So I think what I'll do is I will start with um, our first discussion. And I thought, you know, at the beginning of each class, ad nauseum I know sometimes, and I try to keep it limited at shows to the first class I do this, and then I keep it abridged for the rest of the classes. But I, I want to make a record of um, talking about things like batting, thread, uh, let's go into some tension. And what I think I'll do is after every section of the discussion that we're talking about, for example, I'm going to start with batting. So after our batting discussion, um, we'll wait. There's about a 30-second lag here for us. Um, so at that point, if you have any questions, just go ahead and ask questions. I'm not over by the screen. Um, I'm not going to be doing the wrapper room thing. Um, hello, everybody. I love you all. You know that. 
um, but I'd rather stick to specific questions and Rich will be able to ask us those questions and that will keep things a little more clean and crisp the way that um, I would like to see things when I'm watching things. So let's go into our discussion about batting. You know, being a surface quilter, and surface quilter takes up a lot of different things, and I call it surface quilting when I am referring to you are quilting the three quilt sandwiches together, your quilt top, your batting, and your backing. That can refer to hand quilters, sit-down quilters, and stand-up frame quilters. I don't, I don't differentiate between long-arm quilters and sit-down quilters. I just think that's silly. You're a surface quilter or you're a piecer. Those are the two different things. If I'm referring to piecing, and we will be having some really cool piecing things coming up soon, um, then we'll be referring to piecing. But when we're talking surface quilting, we're talking about surface quilting. So let me talk a little bit about my take on batting. And this is kind of, I've been doing this for um, 22, 23 years. I think that's when I got my first machine. Um, it was a... Um, APQS Ultimate One back before stitch regulators. Stitch regulators had not even come out yet from anybody. Uh, didn't even have a single stitch. You had to turn the little knob to get the needle down and up. And um, so that was kind of my um, my um, thing. And I had never sewn before, other than I think I made a T-shirt and a backpack in my home ec class uh, when I was a, a kid in school. Um, so nonetheless, let's move into batting. So one of the things that I have found in my 23 years, and I love to do custom work, even though now I'm doing a lot of edge-to-edge -edge computerized, because I'm starting to fall in love with the computerized systems for edge-to-edge. -edge. Um, but that being said, um, one of the things that I found for me is I'm not a big fan of 100% cotton batting for most things. Edge-to-edge, -edge, sure. Um, baby quilt that they don't want a lot of puffiness in. Okay, I get that. But typically when I'm doing my custom work and a lot of the stuff that we'll be showing on this channel, I'm going to be using something that with a little more meat. And I would also like to add that if you're new to surface quilting, whether you're a sit-down quilter or whether you're a stand-up quilter, until you get really comfortable with tension, I would suggest to you to go with a thicker batting. That way you're going to have a little bit of time to be working out your tension issues. Um, uh, again, I'm not a big 100% cotton batting fan for new quilters, and definitely there's a lot of mythology out there like we're supposed to be magicians and make everything work. The one thing I will say is this, a lot of new quilters assume that using 100% cotton batting or some of the thinner battings out there, that they should be able to use, uh, for example, let's say somebody had a white muslin backing and then they had a, col a dark color quilt top, that they should be able to use white thread on the back, and darker thread on the top and that it should they should be able to get good tension. The bottom line is this, most quilters are not going to get good tension. You're going to have pokies on the bottom, you're going to have pokies on the top. We'll go into tension later, uh, but just know that you're not a bad quilter if you're struggling with this thing. If you want to use different colored threads top and bottom, then my suggestion to you is always to go with a nice uh, thicker batting. For example, um, I tend to use Hobbs most of the time because that's what our area is willing to pay for. Um, uh, a lot of people will bring me like uh, dream batting um, if they prefer to have that. Um, but typically I'm going to be working with Hobbs, so I'm going to refer to that. Um, but if I wanted something with different color threads, then I might go for either the, um, the Dream Poly, uh, Dream Puff, which is a little bit thicker if you're using the dream batting. And then if you're using the Hobbs batting, then I would go with the poly down because you've got a little bit more room there for error based on that tension to get that stitch right in the middle as we go. Um, so again, um, that's kind of how I would handle it if you do want to use different, different color threads. Every once in a while I'll have a client bring me 100% cotton batting. And with that issue, they'll say, I want to use different color threads, top and bottom. And I usually will just say no. The one thing to remember, if you are quilting for clients, or if you are the client, you are coming to us because you believe that we know what we're doing. And that means we know what we're doing. And so there are things that just work, and there are things that don't work. And one of the things that don't work is thin batting and trying to get good tension with uh, the thin battings and different color thread top and bottom. I actually tend to do a lot of double bats 
In fact, I would say, other than my edge-to-edge -edge computerized quilting, um, any of my custom work is typically, 100% of the time, has a double bat. I like using a Hobbs 8020 towards the back and then a wool towards the top. That's my favorite recipe. Um, but if I have somebody that's sensitive to wool, then what I tend to use is the Hobbs 8020 towards the back and then the um, poly down towards the top. Um, the, o the other option when I'm doing that sometimes is I'll get a quilt top that has a lot of white fabric um, in the piecing in the top, and then I actually will not be using the wool. I will be going right for the 80-20 towards the back, and then I will be going towards the um, poly down towards the top because it's white and it's not going to dull that uh, white fabric being right under it. So um, let me see. The wool, by the way, if you're using a Hobbs wool or a Dream wool, and I've heard the 3M wool is pretty good. I used to use it a while ago. It's been a few years since I used it. Um, the quality kind of fluctuated a little bit, and so I moved away from it. Uh, but when I was using those three battings, definitely the Dream, definitely the Hobbs, the washing when you wash a quilt, it's exactly the same as uh, like an 80-20. So in other words, you're not going to, even with hot water, because I wash most of my own quilts in hot water to test things, uh, but even using the wool, I've never had more shrinkage than what I would have gotten from an 80-20. The other thing that I might add with the batting issue is um, people love the look of wool, or they love that puff from the puffier poly battings. The one suggestion I have is if you're doing a wall hanging or a show quilt, you kind of want to make sure that what you're going to do is double bat it with a base batting, uh, batting excuse me, underneath. Um, I, again, I use 80-20 towards the back, and what happens is when it's a wall hanging or a show quilt that's going to hang in a show, when I use those two battings, that's going to keep that quilt perfectly stable. And the, uh, the under batting, the 80-20, is going to keep it hanging straight. If I simply use the single wool or a single poly down um, as a batting, that quilt's going to wave like a flag. It's never going to hang straight unless you're constantly doing the, um, uh, you know, the laying it out, wetting it, and um, um, ah, that, that flew out of my head. The, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, blocking. The blocking of the quilt and I don't like to block any more than anybody else um, I typically am just not a blocking kind of guy and so I find that the double battings that way is gonna do the trick for me um, so those are kind of my positions on batting I'm not big on the uh, extravagant battings you know like the silks and the um, bamboo um, the one bamboo that I have used that I've I've liked a lot when I've used it is windline I believe is the name of it, and um, I find her process of creating that batting to be a, a, a pretty healthy process, and I, I, I found that that is the, the one that I would use if I were going to go with the bamboo batting. Um, silk blends, you know, I think they're a bit pricey, um, but, you know, and I, I, I think after multiple washes, you're, you're going to have some issues anyways, in my opinion, from what I've seen from testing them. Uh, especially for someone that doesn't know how to wash and treat quilts. If you're using a lot of hot water and sort of thing, you're going to get some deterioration fairly quickly. Uh, when I've done some of the testing, I haven't been happy with the results by about the 10th to 12th wash. So those are some of my opinions on the um, battings um, themselves. So uh, before we go into the next discussion, which will be threads, uh, we're going to wait. I'm going to give it about a 30-second lag. And then, Rich, if there were any questions about batting, or if you have any questions about batting, this is a good time to ask. While we're waiting for that, I also wanted to uh, encourage people, please, uh, Please feel free to, and we'd appreciate if you subscribe to our new YouTube channel, to the Quilter's Apothecary YouTube channel. Uh, that way you will get notices when we're going live and uh, when new videos come out, etc. So please subscribe to the, hit the subscribe button for the Quilter's Apothecary YouTube.
So also let me add real quick, um, you know, I have my Jamie Wallen um, YouTube channel, but I would say switch over. Um, go over to the Quilters Apothecary channel. There's actually going to be a lot more content there than there will be at the Jamie Wallen channel. And before, and while we're waiting to see if anybody has any questions, one of the things that I do get asked a lot when we're talking about batting is, is there a right side and a wrong side? Before I get up and come over to the camera to show you a few things, one of the things that I want to say, and I hear from batting companies all the time that give talks, um, people will ask, is there a top, is there a bottom to 80-20, or 70-30 or that type of batting and the answer from the companies is typically no there's not a difference I have to disagree and um, you know I won't make statements like I do in class sometimes like well we actually quilt so we can see the difference there is a difference and what I find myself when I am using the 80-20 um, or any of the blend batting such as that there actually is a difference and let me bring this over to the camera I want to get a bit close. When I am using an 80-20 or a cotton poly blend, what I'm doing on this side, you can kind of see, hopefully, in there, you can see the little sweater balls. It's like pilling that you would see on an old sweater. That is going to face up. The other side of this batting is actually going to be a lot smoother. You can see that it, it doesn't have that texture such as the other side does. And again, you can see, you can see those sweater balls. You can see the pilling on that side. Now, there may not have been an, an intentional right or wrong side to that batting when it was produced. And I don't know the, how, how it's produced exactly. But I will say that I find that things float up to the top, um, in my opinion. And so those little pills and the little sweater balls are actually going to come through the back on a lot of quilts if you hit them. So always have the pilling, the pilling or the sweater balls facing up. Pimples up, dimples down. All right, Jamie, here's your first question. It's from Linda F. Who makes the poly down? Poly down is made by Hobbs. Hobbs makes poly down, and actually I have a sample of it right here. It is 100% polyester. It is a nice substitute for wool when you, um, when you can't use wool or it's not applicable or the client doesn't want to pay for it. It is a really nice loft. It's got a little bit of thickness to it. So it looks wonderful in a quilt. It's definitely going to show off the quilting, whether it's single bat or double bat but it is made by Hobbs and it is 100% poly and it is the same on both sides. So there is not an up, there is not a downside on this particular batting. Down. Okay, Jamie, the next question is from Railway Quilt Studio. Uh, what else can cause bearding, if anything? What else can cause bearding? That's a great question. So um, one of the things that I mentioned already is to have your 80-20 flip the wrong way. The other thing, frankly, which causes bearding would be a dull needle. Um, I'm not typically a uh, every new quilt deserves an, a needle guy. I am a um, pop, pop, pop. When I hear pop, 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 that's when I'll change my needle, um, which could be two or three quilts down the road. Um, so just know that. So it could be a dull needle. Um, typically, what I find right now is causing a lot of the bearding is unwashed backs. I never load a backing on my machine that has not been pre-washed because there's issues. And um, I've heard people say that, nah, there's no issues, there shouldn't be a difference. Of course there's a difference. They're putting now, I would suggest, anywhere from five to ten times more sizing on the fabric because we're not buying fabric like we used to. And that fabric has to set and look beautiful on that quilt shop shelf for anywhere from one to four years, especially if it's not a shop that does a lot of constant sales. And so in order to kind of counteract that so you're, they're, they're not getting a lot of dust, dirt, it's not making the fabric dingy, People are putting more sizing on the fabrics now and including formaldehyde. And so with that, what's happening is the fabric is a lot more stiff, which means now when the needle goes through the top, 
um, and then enters out the bottom. It's almost like a screw coming through a piece of tin on the back. Instead of spreading the fibers like it's supposed to do, the fabric is so stiff that the needle is punching through the fabric. Now I've heard a lot of talk about um, ballpoint needles um, being one of the solutions to that. Um, I like sharp needles, um, but I, a lot of my amazing fellow quilters and teacher friends uh, swear by the, the ballpoint needle. I just like a nice sharp needle. And I find that as long as I pre-wash my back um, and that my clients pre-wash and they know for me that that's kind of my rule. Um, and if they don't pre-wash it, I'll pre-wash it. Um, that I just never have that issue. It spreads that fiber and that needle is going to go right down through there. But with that fabric so stiff, if it hasn't been pre-washed, what's going to happen is the needle is going to hit it and it's going to punch through and it's going to bring some of that batting through. So that's kind of the long term of why this stuff can happen. Um, you know, and again, double check your 80-20, make sure you have it right side up. I know that there are some instructors out there a few um, and other fellow quilters who have heard the opposite pimples down dimples up that's not the way it's supposed to be obviously if the pimples are down the needle hits it it's going to go through the back the other thing i will say is this about the pre-washing the fabric issue when you pre-wash the backing fabric it doesn't matter if you pre-wash the top all of my quilts i never pre-wash my top fabric unless it's a dark fabric that i'm afraid is going to bleed um, so because of that um, but I always pre-wash my back. When I wash my quilt, I don't get any weird shrinkage. I just, I don't have those issues whatsoever. I think that the fabric has been so treated these days, um, before it's, uh, before all the sizing gets re-added to it, that we tend to not have a lot of issues with shrinkage. Um, the one thing that I might say is that using the 100% cotton batting might make the difference with that. Okay. Uh, this next question, Jamie, is from Bonnie C. Bonnie C. That you know. My Bonnie? Uh, yep, yeah, you're Bonnie. Hey, Bonnie. I think you've already answered this question, but <laughs> what causes the batting punch through on the backing? So I think you've kind of answered that yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. So again, it's the um, um, not pre-washing the back or having your 80-20 upside down, just like we were just talking about. So those, those things um, are, are a big deal. Um, and I have to tell you, just a little quick story. So Mr. Ritchie um, quilted one of his first quilts about, what was it, two months ago, three months ago. And um, what he did was um, he used uh, cotton sateen. And it was that quilt right there and um, that he just showed you. And when he did, I'm like, you didn't pre-wash that. You just took that off the bolt and you loaded it on the machine. You've got to pre-wash. You've got to take it home. No, I'm fine. I'll do it right now. It's like, okay. So on the back of that quilt, he had his batting, which he used 80-20, right side up. So everything went fine. But bearding on the back had batting coming through the back. And also there were areas of that quilt where it looked like the needle had punched through the fibers. It destroyed the fibers. So um, that would be... Um, no, there's proof. Proof in the pudding. Rich did it. No other questions? Okay. So let's move on. And if you have any other questions about batting, you can always ask them later on. Let's move a little bit into thread. You know, again, I know that we have a lot of newish quilters um, who haven't been quilting a lot. And I would say that I am a, when it comes to thread, I am a poly purist uh, rather than a cotton purist. I'm not big on cotton threads. Um, it's not that I don't like them. I think they're wonderful, and I know we have a lot of wonderful cotton purists out there who love to use them. Uh, when I do use a, a cotton thread, I actually like to use um, Superior King Tut, I think is my cotton of choice that I use. Um, and I'll be dropping name, brand names in there, but you know we're not affiliated with anybody, but I'm just telling you what I use and I like to use. But the one thing I will say is this when it comes to thread. That's not going in my bobbin. You know, I, I found for myself years ago that I am a 40 weight poly purist. So typically when I'm doing my client quilts or something that's not a show quilt, unless I'm doing something with micro work, that I'm going to have a nice 40 weight thread in my bobbin no matter what, because that's one less thing I have to worry about. Uh, it is mythology that we have to match weight to weight. 
Um, so in other words, a lot of people say if you use 40 weight on the back, you, you should be using 40 weight on the top. If you're using 60 weight on the top, you should be using 60 weight on the back. That's all mythology. That doesn't wash anymore. I, I don't know that it ever washed, but it was something that sounded right when we all started quilting. Um, and so we just kind of kept passing that information on. And throughout the years, what I found is it doesn't matter what weight I have in my top. If I'm running um, 50, 60 weight, even um, um, the 100 weight, I might switch to a 60 weight in my bobbin. But typically, 99% of the time, I'm running a nice 40 weight uh, thread in my backing, in my bobbin. It's smoother. It's not going to get caught. I'm, and I, I'm going to say that this is, again, my opinion. There are going to be people that disagree with me. And, um, but I find myself that there are times when I've used cotton in the bobbin that what will happen is if I'm using like a fragile thread, like let's say a metallic or an invisible thread, um, or something like that, and it goes down, and especially with some of the cheaper type cottons, there's so much fluff and slough and nubs on that cotton thread that it's going to go grab it, and then when the thread rubs against itself to give it tension, it's going to grab and you're going to get weird tension, and you're going to be saying things like, um, my machine doesn't like to use this thread. Well, it would probably love it on top, but I find that bobbin threads like to be smooth, uh, at least in my world. I don't want to mess. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for messing around with threads and playing with tension and getting everything just right. That's not the type of clientele that I have. Um, and so I like to use a nice 40 weight poly in my bobbins 100% of the time. And I'm pretty much um, isocord. I love my Isocord 40 weight embroidery thread. It comes in hundreds of colors. It's uh, one of my favorite threads to use. One of my favorite threads to use. Um, my machines love it. You know, and I have multiple brands of machines and I've run multiple brands of machines and I teach them multiple brands and I find that the Isocord is most of the time a good go. Every once in a while I'll run across a machine that doesn't like it. And machines, there are machines that don't like specific threads. Um, the other thread that I really like is Glide. Now, the one thing I will say about Glide is it has a lot more shine than the Isocord. Um, so if I'm doing something that's a primitive type quilt or a homespun or something like that, I'm probably not going to uh, aim towards the Glide. Um, and actually, what I would suggest as a teacher to other people is um, so fine. A lot of people like to use so fine on the top when they're using something that's a more primitive quilt, a little more traditional where they don't want a shiny thread, but they want the strength of poly because the so fines have the strength of poly, but they actually look like cotton when they are quilted into the quilt, which is wonderful. But for me personally, even if I do use the so fine on top, I'm still using my isocord or my glide in the bobbin. I'm not a pre-wound guy. I'm a wind my own bobbin kind of guy. And I think the pre-wounds round, as far as bobbins are fine for people that like to use them. I just find more consistently when I, consistency when I wind my own bobbins. I prefer that. I get more control and I certainly have more control over the color. But again, we actually carry and sell the um, um, Magna Glide bobbins. Um, and by the way, most people when you use the Magna Glide bobbin, you want to make sure to take out the check spring in your bobbin case because that, that wants to be removed uh, with the Magna Glides. Um, so there we go. So I am a poly purist. Um, I like the 40 weights. Um, if you are a superior person, and a lot of people are caught on per certain brands, and you want to try the, um, their 40 weight, it's of course Magnifico. Um, I've tried it a few times and had good luck with it, but I have such a big stash of my other threads that um, I just haven't gravitated towards it to use. Um, if you are a YLI thread fan, um, I, I love Jim's um, Polish Poly. That one worked really well for me, but again, I just have so many hundreds of cones of the Isocord. That's kind of the one that I tend to gravitate towards because I have so much of it. Um, so while we are talking about thread, let me say this as well. Again, if I were using cotton on top, I'm still going to be using my, my 40 weight poly in the bobbin. Some people will prefer using the 60 weights. They're, they become real popular now. Um, one of my best friends, Linda Hershka, um, loves using the um, 60 weight polys. Um, she's, she's found good luck with that. Um, 
So, you know, and, and I have a lot of other friends that really like using the 628 poly. I like 40 weight. Um, it's myself, it's thin enough. It gives uh, stability, in my opinion, to the quilt. That's why I tend to use it. It might be a mental thing, but it's just kind of what I found for myself. You know, I always think of the bobbin thread as the foundation of the house. And um, I know that there are a lot of people that are using 100 weight, 120 weight, silk, um, and micro quilter type stuff in their bobbin. You know, but we want to remember that those are specialty threads, in my opinion, meant for specialty things such as micro work. And, um, you know, even when I've used the micro quilter from Superior, in and the top to do which is a hundred weight poly um, to do micro quilting I'm using that will be the time I will switch to a 60 weight poly in my bobbin um, just to give myself uh, a thinner thread in the bobbin so but I I personally you're not gonna see me put a hundred weight of the poly or the thinner silks in the bobbin of my thread you know a lot of the heavy heavy show quilters that use these things and 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 promote them you know like I always joke about they they spend a year to a year and a half on these amazing gorgeous show quilts but my client with the t-shirt quilt or my client that just wants a nice custom quilt um, you know they're not going to be taking care of these quilts like they would their children you know and our show quilts definitely get taken care of and they're treated very special yes questions so, hey, I, hey, I have a question from Long Arm Love. Uh, do you ever use a monofilament thread? If so, what brand do you use? What do you use in the bobbin? Absolutely. So I do. And my favorite invisible thread is Superior Brand Mono Poly is my absolute favorite. I love it, love it, love it. One of the reasons I love it is because it's polyester based it's not nylon based now I know that a lot of nylon based invisible threads out there by people that I love and make these threads um, <clears throat> the claim is that they are heat treated um, and that they won't yellow and I've had enough issues early on in my quilting with yellowing and also with melting. Uh, I ha I've had a few clients and I have tons of fellow quilters and students that have used a lot of the nylon threads based invisible monofilament threads. It's fish line. A fish line melts. And so you um, quilt a quilt for somebody. And we have to remember, you know, a lot of people will use this stuff on, on stuff like t-shirt quilts that go to colleges, that go to people, Harley guys you know they don't they're not really careful about how they treat their quilt they throw them in a hot dryer and you know most people it's a blanket and so what'll happen is they'll put it in a hot a, a dryer after it's been washed through a wash cycle and do they put it on a nice low or medium heat for a half an hour and then take it out and let it dry naturally of course not they're going to put that baby in for an hour and a half high heat and with some of these threads i've had them melt um, and you lose all the quilting. And so I have found that with the invisible um, monopoly from Superior, and there are other brands, by the way, that are poly-based. Um, I'm not sure, but I think Madeira is a poly-based um, invisible. I haven't used it in years. Um, but these two have always worked well for me. And by the way, when I use these two in the top, they will never go in my bobbin. What goes in my bobbin is still my 40 weight poly. Um, and if I want a thinner thread, uh, which I don't, but if you want a thinner thread in your bobbin, then maybe go with a 60 weight um, with your um, hair thin, because this is hair thin um, thread on the top. But I have never had issues with this snapping or breaking after regular washes. And I am, I am hard on my quilts that I quilt because that way when I'm up here blabbing away at you I want to be able to say nope this is what I do I wash my quilts in scalding hot water with tons of tide just to test so that when I'm doing this I can say that so again I use superior monopoly and let me add real quick it comes in two colors it comes in white clear and it comes in smoke as most invisibles from any brand um, will do um, 95% of the time I'm using the smoke because normally I'm doing it on color. The only time that I use this whitish 
version of the invisible threads is going to be on white fabric. Um, otherwise, I'm going to find that I can get a little bit of a sheen. And so I prefer the smoke 90 plus percent of the time with whatever type of neutral bobbin in in my bobbin. Yes, sir. And that, and that. Linda F., uh, do you have a color of thread that you find works great with me? Yes. Yes. Yay! So, and a lot of you already know what I'm going to say, and it's I've been saying this for years. Baby poop. That's what I call it. It's my baby poop color, and in Isocord brand, it's actually 0232 in the Isocord, and I absolutely love it. That being said, um, I think in the, uh, the, 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 the Glide, it is, um, is it Sweet Pea or uh, 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 Prickly Pear? Prickly Pear is the, the close color. And it's like, a, it's like a gold with a little bit of chartreuse green mixed in. And I got to tell you, people love this color once, once I turn them on to it. Because it goes with traditional looking quilts, but it also goes great on jewel tones. Um, it just it doesn't overtake anything. I mean, I just find that if I don't know what color thread to go on anything, I remember what used to be amazing. What was it called? It was almost like a um, a khaki kind of color. It was mother. Oh gosh, what was that? Um, I remember it shortly. Um, but it was a thread. Uh, mother goose. Mother goose. It was mother goose. I remember mother goose was popular. It's like if if like that's the only thread that most quilt studios had early on in, in our long arm quilting days was Mother Goose goes on everything. But I have found that this this um, baby poop gold green um, thread, it just works really well. And you're going to find your own. And by the way, when I'm talking about threads before the next question, um, and you're new to quilting, a lot of times we'll go and we'll go crazy with threads. And people always tend to gravitate towards the really dark threads or the really light threads. And I got to tell you, Go towards medium tones. If you're new and you're, buy, and you're making your first few purchases to build your stash of thread, go towards the medium tones blues. Go towards medium to light. We don't want to go too dark. You know, most of us, when we've been quilting, we make the mistake where we think just because there's some dark purple in the quilt, and we love dark purple, if you're that person, um, you always put the dark purple in. I did it as well. And what would happen is you'd be halfway across your first row and say, oh my gosh, is that as gaudy as it feels? And then we just keep quilting. And it's like you learn that lesson pretty fast. So I always say if you're doing an edge to edge on a quilt, I squint at the quilt. And what I'll do is I'll find the medium tones. And then I'll go a few shades lighter than some of the medium, to uh, medium tone in the quilt itself. And then I never have a fail. It always is going to work great. Um, another question? Mini, mini. Vicky M asked, I don't understand the Magna Bobbin comments. I think she's referring to the Magna Glide. Yes. Bobbins, do you want me to take part of this? Yes, absolutely. So, Vicky, what Magna Glide is talking about in their bobbins is there is, they want you to remove the check spring. Uh, so, because the magnet replaces it, I've got a box here, and I think you can see it. Sorry. Right on the box, it asks you to remove your check spring because the magnet on the bobbin behaves as the check spring. It slows the bobbin down so it doesn't backlash. Now, what I can tell you, however, as a handy quilter dealer, that handy quilter does not recommend that you remove your check spring regardless. They say leave it in. Uh, but when Jamie talks about this, this is what he's referring to when he talks about removing the check spring from Magna Glide bobbins. Are you ready for the next question, Jamie? Absolutely. Because my quilting is still not perfect, I like to, and this is from BKP Troy, I'm sorry. Because my quilting is still not perfect, I like to use fine thread in the background quilting, like invisible. Invisifil, but I cannot get it, uh, I can get not, get it to not shred and break. Sorry. Okay, so, um, well, let's talk about it. So, you, you're saying that you're using your Invisifil, which I know a lot of people use and they really love it. 
So let me say this. We have, what is it, 10 machines in this studio? I've, all, I've had multiple machines for years. There are machines that don't like certain threads. I just have to say that to you, number one. And if you want a thinner thread, and that's kind of your thing, you may have a really big stash of thread, but if you're struggling every time you load it, then maybe it's time for you to switch over to a different thread. Um, you know, because not all machines like all threads, and people don't want to hear that, and machine companies don't want us probably to say that, but the bottom line is um, there are just threads that some machines don't like. Um, now, here is, here is the other thing. It could very possibly be your machine might be, and this is just a possibility, I'm not saying that it's so, but if you're getting a lot of shredding, um, your machine could be out of time. Um, and it might not be out of time bad, but just enough that when you're going in a certain direction, um, you're getting some shredding. For example, I know that typically if you're on the freehand side of the machine and you're quilting, coming towards you, and this is a test for you. So here would be your test. 14 inch square, 12 inch square, 10 inch square, whatever square. And what I want you to do is I want you to go counterclockwise in a square with your thread. And what I want you to do is to come down, stop, go over the bottom, stop, and then I want you to come up, stop, and then go all the way over to, from, to the left from the right. Now if it's a timing issue, typically when you're going up and freehand side from um, right to left is when you're going to be running into issues. So it could be, like I said, that your machine might be just a little bit out of time, um, and so you're getting that shredding um, and that sort of thing. Um, we just had a, a few machines in, and I won't say the name of the thread, but um, we found that, gosh, it was like four machines, and all of a sudden they were having issues, and they were getting shredding. And what happened was, the thread had been changed just enough uh, from the manufacturer that it was shredding. And then when we put in other types of thread, no shredding. And so again, you know, remember, um, and I'm not saying that that's what's happening with yours, but those are some of the options uh, that you may want to check out and may want to figure out. You know, not all thread companies change, but I will say this, they shop around. They do change. Threads do change. It can you can have a really good batch for a long time, and then that thread company could be shopping their thread somewhere else, and the the place that they find to produce it at that point, they're not making it exactly the same, and it's enough that's going to cause issues. And so um, we have found that with a few threads out there. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So the shredding, in my opinion, is this. Um, you could be just a little bit out of time, um, or your machine just doesn't like that thread. Um, and there you go. All right, all right. Jamie, this is from Pat C. Do you have the same color in your bobbin? Yes, I do, most of the time, unless I'm double batting, or they've asked specifically, like if I get a white muslin batting, or I'm sorry, backing, and I have a dark jewel tone or a black base top, um, and they want me to use white on the back and color on the top, uh, again, I always tell them I have to double bat or I have to put a thicker batting in there because so that we don't have to deal with any pokies. Um, and that's, that's, that's when I would do that. So, so I guess, I'm sorry, the answer is no, I don't always have the same thread color top and bottom. But I will tell you this, I do on my edge to edge because we offer free batting for our edge to edge service and we use 8020. Um, it's got a nice loft, it's thicker than the 100% uh, cotton, but yet it wouldn't be thick enough for me if I had a white muslin back and, um, um, and a dark thread on the top to not get pokies one side or the other. So in, in, with our edge to edge, we use the same color top and bottom and we just make sure that our clients are aware of that. So they need to pick their backing accordingly or just 
understand that it's the back of the quilt. Um, because again, we're not magicians, we're quilters, and if they give us thin battings, um, then that's kind of it. And I will say this, uh, when just I'm going to throw this out there if you're doing client quilts. Um, this is not McDonald's. The customer is not always right. And if they bring you cheap, cheap batting, um, and you know what I'm talking about when I say cheap batting, you know, um, I am a Joann's fan. I like to buy uh, uh, a lot of things from Joann's. Um, I like to buy a lot of things from the different shops out there, the different stores. But I know the difference between um, some of the quality battings that they carry at those shops and some of the less expensive budget battings that they may be carrying at that shop to get them into the right price point that people do. Um, so again, I, I'm just I'm pretty picky about what I'm willing to allow to come into my, my studio. Jimmy, this is from BKP Troy again. Do you have any advice to prevent thread breaks when using a finer thread? And for Rich, do you think the machine timing would affect that? Do the machines need to be timed to specific threads? I think, Jamie, you probably got those. Yeah, what was the first question again? I'm sorry. Uh, do you have any advice to prevent thread breaks when using a finer thread? Absolutely, and we're going to talk about that shortly. We're going to go into tension in a little bit here, and I'm going to walk you through my... I have that tension tutorial that became so popular um, years back, but actually I want to add some stuff to that, and that will cover that specifically. Um, and Rich, what was the second part of that question? I'm sorry. Uh, do you think the, the machine timing would affect that? Uh, do machines need to be timed for specific types of thread? This is where I always get in trouble. But I'm here to give my opinions. So my opinion, and Rich will give his opinion afterwards, because uh, I think we disagree. Um, do I think... That machines need to be timed to specific threads. You know, I don't think so. I don't think that that matters. Uh, the one thing that I might say is this: I I would say that machines on occasion needs need to be retimed to different size needles. And I would say this: the rule of thumb is this: the scarf. I'm a Grosbecker fan of needles. I use Grosbeckers. Um, which is a sh uh, Schmetz company, I believe, still. they One and bought the other, I don't know, but it's the same company. But I find the Gross Beckerts to be my favorite and the best needles that I use that I really like. Um, now, uh, I'm an 18 size needle guy. I should not see stars when I hold up a quilt using a size 18 needle. Um, but a lot of people like to use 16. You have a lot of show quilters teaching, and they'll tell us to use stuff like 14 size needles or 12 size needles. If you're a uh, MR size person, I know that the, the 4.0 equals 18, 3.5 is 16, so that's kind of how that size goes. But I have found that as you drop in needle size, um, supposedly the rule of thumb is that uh, the good needle manufacturers, that scarf does not change. So in other words, if you drop from a size 18 needle down to a 12 needle, that scarf, where the hook is going to hit that scarf, is going to be the exact same place. But that being said, it's a thinner needle. There's constant deflection. And so in my opinion, if I'm using a size 18 needle and I tend to be a fast quilter, I may not have any trouble. But when I change down to a size 12 needle or even a 14 needle, when I skip a size down, I find that for me, my hook likes to brush that needle just a little closer than it did before because I'm going to be getting more needle deflection. That needle is going to be constantly bending because it's not a home machine. The needle does not stop. Everything comes to a stop on a home machine sit down when it takes a stitch. When we're quilting with our long arms, even though the hopping foot comes down, and by the way, I am a one-to-do business card guy. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but uh, bottom line is this. When, when, that, when that hopping foot comes down, that needle is deflecting like this. And if you have a really thin needle and you're going at fast speed, 
you're going to get issues that tend to look like timing issues. And that's when I would suggest you might want to tweak if you're comfortable with timing. And timing is one of those things you have to be trained and you have to be comfortable to maybe let it brush the needle just a little bit closer with, with the thin needles. And slow down, for goodness sakes. If you're using a thinner needle, slow down. Okay, Jamie, we have a question from Darcy D. Can you show a sample of top and bottom thread that you would match then? She also says, well, what I mean is you use the 40 weight poly in the bobbin and the top question mark? Yes, I do use the 40 weight bobbin 90% of the time top and bottom. But I got to tell you, I also use invisible thread. I don't know the weight of invisible thread. I hate to say I'm ignorant about that. I know it's thin. Let me see here. I don't even know if it's on the package. Um, it's hair thin. And, but even when I'm using my invisible thread, I'm still using uh, to do ditch work only, by the way. I only use the invisible for me personally to do ditch work, not to do feathers or flowers or all overs, any of that stuff. Um, but I'm still using my 40 weight poly in the bobbin. When I use metallic, um, whether it be the superior metallic, uh, which is one of my favorites, um, I love that it's nice and strong. I'm still using 40 weight poly in my bobbin. I'm certainly using an embroidery type uh, poly like the isocord or the glide. In there because it's smoother it's not going to catch on the metallic I find I just have no trouble and I can run metallic on absolutely any machine um, so even by the way if I'm using the micro quilter on top or uh, let's say I'm using um, on a heavy traditional or primitive quilt what if I'm using 50 weight um, so fine because I want that dull cotton look of the thread but even though that's a poly thread I'm still using my 40 weight poly in the bobbin because I want that smoothness. It's one less thing I have to worry about. If, I only, if, if you find one type of thread that you love, and for me it's the isocord or glide to use in my bobbin, it's just one less thing I ever have to worry about. And, I, you know, that's the way I roll. When I first started, I would match threads. You know, if I'm using cotton in the top, I'm going to use cotton in the bobbin if I'm using this. And I was constantly messing with tension and messing up bobbin cases. It was a pain. And so I just finally realized I use one in my, there, and it doesn't matter weight to weight. So hopefully that helps clear that up a little bit. Okay, Jamie, I have a question from Patty P. Okay. When I use a double batting, I get skip stitches. Will adjusting my tension fix that? It could. So I'm, I'm thinking of all of the things that could solve that. Here are some things, in my opinion, that could solve that. Um, number one, check your, your quilt sandwich. Uh, make sure you're not too tight. Um, sometimes that will... Uh, make you skip stitches. If your quilt sandwich is too tight, what's too tight? Well, for me, what's too tight is this. I take my finger and I go up through my 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 whole quilt sandwich layer when the quilt's loaded and, I, and I've rolled. And I gr like to grab and I want to be able to grab my finger down almost to my first knuckle. If I can grab more than my first knuckle, my quilt sandwich is too tight. If I can't grab but just the tip of my finger, I'm sorry, it's the opposite. It's too loose if I can grab more than past my first knuckle. If I can't grab the tip of my finger, it's too tight. And because of that tightness, you're going to get skip stitches because you're actually going to get um, some, a little bit more deflection and you're going to get some issues there. So that's one of the reasons um, that I find that I get skip stitches. Here is the other reason that you might be getting skip stitches. How high is your hopping foot? I am a one to two business card guy. I am not a dime. I am not a nickel. I don't, I don't, I, I know that a lot of the machine companies say that that's the way to go. I tell you what, I have no trouble. I have never had any issues with um, quilting as long as I am one to two business cards. Um, so that would be something that I would check with that also. Okay, so we are at the hour point. Um, we covered some thread. We covered batting. This was our first one. Um, I hope you all enjoyed and
throughout the weekend. Again, I will put the schedule up tonight and we will be having a few more discussions, but also, and we'll talk about marketing tools and stuff like that. And also I'll do a tension um, gig for you. But I know that an hour is typically the time that most people are like, get him off of there. Um, so there we go. So I will see everybody down the road. Thank you for joining our first Hold on. live. Hold YouTube. on. Let me, uh, I get a little comment in here. I want to uh, issue my humblest apologies. Uh, the, uh, the link that was up on Facebook yesterday ended up expiring because of a mistake uh, yeah. that I made. So we had to put another one up. So I really want to apologize to anybody that was looking for us and couldn't find us at the time. Uh, again, this is a new thing to us. Uh, we're usually pretty good at technology, but we'll feel our way through this. So my apologies or my apologies to anybody that was looking for it and couldn't find the it. The old link. And of course, uh, this will be up on our page and it'll also be linked through the Long Arm TV website so you can always look at it later. All right, so thank you very much. And Jamie, if you wanna close I wanna up. do a close, but number one, Tomorrow, Mr. Ritchie, would you like to go in on that with the camera? Tomorrow, this is going to be the design we're going to actually be doing. I'm going to show you how to quilt this out. And then we're also going to be adding some fun stuff to it. This is one of our um, new uh, basket weave designs Mystical for quilting. Dimensional. Mystical Dimensional. So that's one of them. And then this weekend as well, give you a little bit of preview on some of the stuff. This is one of my favorites. I absolutely love this. So I'm going to be showing you how to quilt this, this beauty out. Um, and then again, we'll be doing some more stuff. We might be doing some grid work type of things. Um, and we'll also be looking at some of your suggestions if you want a little bit of feather tutorial, um, that sort of thing. Again, thank you for joining us. And I believe on Sunday is when we're going to be doing our fun artsy stuff. We'll be doing some dirty pours. So if you've been interested in doing some dirty pours and since you're stuck at home and you might have some of the supplies for that we can do some dirty pour stuff. And I will show you from start to finish how to mix, um, how to um, do some of the acrylic dirty pours, and what supplies you're going to need. Um, and we'll go with that. So again, thank you, everybody. Mr. Ritchie, are you good? All right. Have an amazing Thursday. Is it Thursday? Oh, my goodness. It is Thursday. Um, so there we go. Um, if you happen to be into folk music, I know that we have an amazing live concert tonight by the Indigo Girls, so you might want to check out their stuff. I know I have a lot of folk quilters out there who like the folk bluegrass the way that I do. And no matter what you're doing, please take care of yourself right now, just like what they say on the airplane. Put your mask on first and then help others. But you've got to take care of yourself because our community, I know, is is a high-risk community because a lot of us are over 50. So take care of yourself, know you're loved, and take care of each other. God bless.